the second part of this lecture, incremental and fundamental innovation, is about fundamental innovation. Hopefully, from the last lecture, you were able to see that um, incremental innovation dominates uh, what most um, most companies do. It is responsible for probably most um, incremental growth as well, meaning that. Um, as we're experiencing today in the sort of 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013 series of years, uh, pretty low growth rate historically because people are taking what they have and changing things slightly and creating um, incremental innovations. But that does not lead to um, the kind of growth that you have when you have fundamental innovation taking over and driving an innovation paradigm which we'll talk about innovation paradigms later in this class. But, you know, an uh, example of that is the transistor leading to integrated circuits, leading to PCs, leading to the Internet, leading to software and operating systems and the Internet. So that is a gigantic innovation paradigm caused by uh, initially a jump in fundamental innovation and and multiple fun you know um, moderate and fundamental innovations uh, over the years to keep that innovation paradigm going so based on what we've been talking about in the incremental phase and looking at our model it's pretty clear that we're going to have to introduce a great amount of uncertainty into multiple uh, elements in order to create the most fundamental of all innovations. So, uh, you know, at least two, but oftentimes three elements are opened up like we've been drawing in a generic way. So we've been drawing these things uh, kind of large, meaning that a lot of things have to be considered. And as we pointed out at the beginning of this class, that essentially means uncertainty. And you have to have resources that let these things interact and decrease over time and so because resources are required and time and uncertainty is there it's a uh, high risk uh, but has, has a chance for um, higher return as well so typically you might not know the exact application if you're really heading out in a fundamental innovation path you don't know exactly how it's going to be implemented and uh, you know of some research that needs to be done to narrow the uncertainty, but not all because you can't tell how that research comes about and what other problems it may or may not reveal along the way. So uh, you actually don't know how fundamental innovation is, in other words, when you start, but by introducing enough uncertainty into all these, you hope that uh, you actually are properly looking for many different solutions, different market applications, different technologies, different implementation. Now, to bring this down a little bit to home, because when I, when I speak this way, sometimes people are sort of, you know, at the surface level getting it. But I'll give you an example that um, um, in, in, our, in the book, in, in Inside Real Innovation, when we go through the details of Amberwave, you'll see that in that case at Bell Laboratories, uh, we had an idea that there was a sort of a group of technologies involved in semiconductors and materials that if we were to investigate various uh, pieces of science and technology within that space that the resulting application space was huge meaning that although we could have picked one we knew that actually because technology was still kind of wide open and we hadn't done a lot of research you couldn't really pick one without increasing risk so that was kind of you know at that time we had not developed this innovation model and obviously those experiences are one of the things that led into us thinking about this. However, um, it was a natural thing to actually say, well, you know, we can't tell exactly which way the technology is going to go. We know that if we're successful in understanding this and we can solve the problems associated with this area, then there will be quite a few applications impacting. And therefore, our chances of having uh, impact uh, is greater. And so that's the kind of way in which you um, increase uncertainty in a controlled way in order to try to arrive and converge at a in a in a new direction um, 
Of course, many iterations are required, and in that example in the book, you can see that, but uh, we'll talk about some other ones. And, and so over time, what you want to do is carefully do research, carefully look at how application space is changing over time, slowly revealing even more information about what people might really need or businesses might really need. And then, of course, how manufacturing and the industry is changing structure uh, as, as we move along. And hopefully, um, after many years, you can converge on, on a fun, fundamental innovation. Um, the time can be long. And so it can take more than five years, which is the limit of even most investors' horizon. And for the most fundamental ones, uh, it takes 10 or 15 years from the moment that uh, you build a, a prototype that the usually the um, promoters, the people that are dreaming of that particular innovation, uh, when they kind of think it can work, it usually takes another 10 or 15 years to convince the rest of the infrastructure uh, in order to converge uh, innovation. And so, um, you know, we'll look at that now. Uh, you can see that here in this graph. Uh, what we've done, and, and this is approximate, of course, you have to put error bars of plus or minus a year in both directions on this, or maybe even a year and a half, two years. Uh, but what we wanted to do was to show, in general, what most many people have observed over time, is that um, if you look at the year of discovery, and when I say the year of discovery, I'm referring to what uh, we're calling uh, the aha moment, where um, actually, R&D has already proceeded to the point that uh, this looks like it can work. So picture a lab bench demonstration where the people that have been working on it for a long time now say, wow, this is really going to work. And, and of course, there's examples of that in the transistor where with the first point, contra point contact transistor, uh, they saw transistor action, and so they knew that the device probably wouldn't stay looking exactly the same as they went through development and commercialization, but at least they knew that once they saw transistor action, it was possible. And so that is an aha moment. So if you look at that, that happened in 1949, but if you look at when um, actually these transistors, point, contract, uh, point contact transistors actually made it to the marketplace, uh, it was a decade later, basically, almost. And we did that for the integrated circuit as well. And you can tell that by looking at the patents of Noyce and Kilby. If you look at when integrated circuits were first shipped, um, in good conversations with Bob Medcalf, um, and also just looking at um, the Ethernet when he first talked about it at a conference, when it was first commercialized in 3Com, uh, a similar delay. And then our own point, uh, which is strained silicon, where we first measured the high mobility and it was clear that it was real and could be used, but it didn't come out in, in a microprocessor uh, until 2004. So uh, what this plot shows, you know, year of first commercial dollar versus year of discovery. And when I say discovery, remember this is at the end of what could be a lengthy research period. So it's at that aha moment. And what you see is that because they all fall on some line, it's kind of interesting and in that uh, you know you have something in a 10 to 15 year uh, delay. What this does tell you is that if you really want a great investment opportunity and there is a fundamental discovery, you never want to invest at the point of discovery. You actually want to uh, wait five to 10 years uh, before placing an investment, depending on the environment and competition for investment and things like that. So there is some actual, now it doesn't mean, by the way, that uh, it will automatically happen 10 or 15 years later, because some things can, can sit on the shelf for decades uh, in order to have complementary technologies come along and combine in an innovation, right? Because remember, there's multiple uh, thing multiple types of technologies and science and everything else in our little bubbles there. So the combination might be elusive and you know the transistor case what most people don't appreciate is that all of the other components were already built like there were small compact rectifiers you know many of the other components were all miniaturized and what was missing was that there was no amplification the triode didn't have a, a miniaturized version and that's why it was so obvious that when the transistor came along 
the other components were all there to create the, the revolution in, in, in miniaturization, which is really you know leading to the integrated circuit, of course. So uh, to summarize here a little bit, uh, there's about a 10 to 15 year delay. Uh, these fundamental innovations uh, typically do like these are all related in a way. The um, the transistor actually eventually led to the integrated circuit, what, which then forced us to connect devices and then drive the transistor uh, to even uh, greater performance uh, when regular manufacturing scaling didn't didn't help anymore. And so these are all related and you know shows you just a portion of the information age paradigm that, that uh, um, occurred during this uh, time period. So the value created is tremendous when you have this. Another example of an innovation paradigm like this is the industrial age. What most people don't appreciate is that you need a stable ecosystem to nurture these innovations over this period of time. And I will emphasize that the um, if your political system or you know the global system or whatever is going on is changing, uh, you will disrupt these kinds of innovations and increase delays. And so uh, th this is where national policies and things like that can interfere tremendously. Incremental innovation, which we talked about in the last lecture, is so short term and is so obvious and normal economic parameters are applied to it, meaning that people investing over a year or two know kind of how to do that and it's self-evident, the risk is fairly low. So incremental innovation is never the concern. What we actually need are fundamental innovations to be constantly you know, over decades coming into the marketplace and that requires uh, an ecosystem which allows them to be created and move through uh, uh, an innovation system. And of course, changes in the middle of the progression of these just delays them further, more than 10 or 15 years, and you get slower periods of growth if that's the case. Uh, this is generally a huge problem because it's um, not something that most people understand. And as I said before, this is after the research phase. And so, um, you know, we're talking about decades of activity. So let's talk about examples. Uh, I told you about the sequence of microprocessors once the innovation paradigm, the PC part of it had been created, uh, then uh, the market application and the um, technologies are fairly well defined. You had to do incremental pieces to the technology, but the implementation was the same. And so you ended up with um, uh, you know just incremental ones. But the original, uh, the original um, microprocessor is a, a great story of how DRAM and the, the, the company that documented this the best because of their success later and, and the um, recordings that were from interviews that were created. Um, Intel was a company that did very well at DRAM until uh, Japan actually started using the statistical processing control methods that we taught them after World War II and we had forgotten about them and so when they did get into the um, the semiconductor uh, market, they were making DRAMs more efficiently with higher yield than we were. And so pretty much everybody in the US that was in DRAM started having a crisis because they were gonna be annihilated. And so um, they desperately looked around and in Intel's case, they, they noticed they had this crazy thing where they had put multiple uh, functionalities together on a single chip for a calculator company in Japan actually. And, uh, you know, they were calling this at the time, I think, a microprocessor instead of a microcontroller. But anyway, it's a little, you know, processing unit that had multiple different areas to it. And uh, they said, wow, this is pretty interesting. So they went and they said, you know, we could sell this into more area. We'll be all right. And so they decided to ramp the microprocessor, but they had to find more applications for it. And they listed 50 things on the, I think it was 50 things on the board. And, and of course, uh, Personal computers were, were not one of the applications. So, um, you know, again, they were opening up the market space, looking at a huge thing.
but what they did is what we're talking about as they move as they moved the head this changed and PCs appeared and it turns out that was the key because at the end of the day that was the one it ended up converging on so again the importance of leaving these open and kind of throwing things out as you go through the different process but maybe adding things as you go along for example in the technology circle you could have competitive technology So there could be competitive technology coming from somewhere else, and you have to add that in as you go along, and that could change the conversion, right? But anyway, the original microprocessor example of a very fundamental shift. Strain silicon, our own story. Um, most of the time before this, the decade or so, people didn't really believe a new material would ever get in there, and the ability to make silicon essentially have mobility near gallium arsenide without having to introduce new elements was really a fundamental shift and um, again uh, really unanticipated took years uh, to arrive it's a 20-year story essentially and so it has the same kind of um, and we'll talk about that later in more detail the transistor certainly already explained that the transistor uh, the way that the progress, which was slow, but eventually had produced miniaturized devices for almost everything else that was needed, capacitors and resistors and um, uh, rectifiers. And so the last missing piece was uh, a small amplifier, which of course uh, took a long time to get to, but when it did, it, it unleashed a, a fundamental wave that we're still feeling. Uh, I mentioned this class, we're going to talk about negative examples, and diode memory is an example of a fundamental shift that we tried to create in a company called Contour Semiconductor. And on paper, uh, there were some circuit topologies that looked really good where you could actually not have uh, transistors. Now, the reason this was significant is that a uh, diode is very simple, and so there's very few layers. So if you look at the number of processes you would need to build the memory, the number of pattern levels would decrease tremendously and the cost would be much less. So very low cost memory uh, could have been accessed. But it turns out that uh, it's you know sort of an underappreciation for the discovery of the transistor in a way. And this happens throughout time too, where people in later generations, uh, you know, it's it's not clear why things converged the way they did. And, and what you find out when you look at carefully at the circuit topologies for diode memory is that without a gain device here and there it doesn't have to be everywhere but here and there you need a gain device which essentially is a transistor adding them and not increasing the number of pattern levels substantially and therefore the cost is very difficult so if you can't build it all out of diodes then ultimately you can't create the disruption so that's an example of a fundamental innovation process that um, did not converge and uh, did not result in a new kind of low-cost memory so um, hopefully now this is a complete model. You understand that uh, this model has the iteration and it. it's got the transactional experiences. It's got the increased uncertainty the further back in time you go. Uh, and that now we have fundamental innovation, which uh, usually requires all three areas if you're out 10, 15 years or more. And then you have incremental innovation that uh, is at the farther end. And then you have sort of medium scale and innovations in the middle and so there's no limit you can have uh, a complete spectrum in here we've just looked at both ends the incremental end and the fundamental end so um, now that hopefully we've taught you in this class how to think about innovation it's not a linear model even though history tends to record it that way and make it um, it, it makes people do linear processes because when you when you record history it actually gets rid of the process and so you don't see the process and you, then you think it's a linear process but it's not uh, we want to just remind you of what people are doing today and about how you should not fall into this mode of operation and so we'll finish with a very short last lecture uh, in the next section